think so far on the left side we are now at 240 euros for the glass and the light and I think on the right we are at 70 euros for the glass and the light. Now there's not necessarily a big price difference between these two substrates so just to make sure that both tanks get an equal amount of plants I just spent a few minutes kind of dividing everything up into good portions. Welcome to a new video everybody, hope you're doing well. Super excited today, we're going to get started with the new Twinscape experiment. Uh, so far we've done CO2 versus no CO2 and Aquasol versus dirt. So this will be the third experiment, uh, low budget versus high budget. And I'm really excited about it. So we're going to be setting up two tanks again, uh, but one tank is going to have very cheap equipment and one tank is going to have very expensive equipment. And these two empty tanks are the same tanks that we've used with the previous experiment. And we're going to be using them again today. And they're actually perfect for this experiment because there's a bit of a quality and a price difference as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, we're not going to use the lights though. These lights are the Chihiros A2 series. Actually really good light. Uh, very affordable as well, but they're a bit of a, a mid-range. So they're not super expensive, but not super cheap either. So we're going to be using some different lights today. So to get started, I'm going to take both tanks out of the shelf. And I'm going to set up at the table. There's so much going on here with all these bars and it's hard to work with. So I'm just going to take these two tanks out, uh, move them to the table, and then we can get started. So let's get straight into it. Let's talk about these two tanks. So these are the two tanks that we've used for the previous experiments as well. But there's actually a bit of a quality difference between the two. So that's why they're actually perfect for this experiment. Now you already might, might see it, the, the glass from this tank is a little bit more bluish and the, tank, the glass from this tank is a little bit more greenish. That's going to be our low budget tank and this one's going to be our high budget or our fancy tank. So this aquarium is a 36P that I bought from Green Aqua, um, I think it was two years ago or something. So this is the home brand Green Aqua Optic White Aquarium. I think this one cost me about 40 euros and this one on the left, this is from a brand called Ila. I think this one was 70 euros. So this glass is a little bit more clear. It's a little bit thicker as well. I think this is maybe five millimeters and this is four millimeter glass. And yeah, if we take a closer look at the, um, the edges and the silicone work, this tank is just a bit more high quality. So that's a good starting point, point for our low budget versus high budget. So cheap tank, expensive tank. So I've just installed the, the light on the high budget tank, um, but the camera is not really enjoying it. You can excuse the flickering. This is the Skylight AQI 40, I think. I'll put all the, the names and the, the numbers on the screen. But I'm not really enjoying this flickering. So I think for the purpose of this video, for just for the making of, I'm gonna to switch to a different light that doesn't flicker because it's gonna be very annoying. So during the, uh, the, during the setup, we will use this Jihiro's light just because it doesn't flicker. And then once we're done setting up these two tanks, we're going to move them back to the shelf and then we'll swap for the, the skylight. So this is the light that we're going to be using for this experiment. This light is 170 euros. So that's a very expensive light, especially for a 20 liter tank. But it's perfect for the experiment. So uh, let's now move on to the budget, uh, budget tank. So for the budget light, I have the Twinstar 30B. This is, light is a 30 euros. So we have 170 versus 30. So this is going to be very interesting. So the Twinstar 30B is the same light that I've used recently on the, um, the no filter Guppy Aquascape, which we have right here. I've set this aquarium up, I think it was three weeks ago now, and it's doing really well. So this is the exact same light that we're going to be using for our budget tank. Okay, so that's the Twinstar 30B installed. That's our budget light. I quite like it. I mean, for a 30 euro light, it's, it's proper bright actually. I'm just gonna quickly turn on the skylight again, just to have them side by side, and then we can see the actual visual difference and the, the, the difference between the intensity.
perfect. I've managed the, the skylight to stop flickering. It was only on for on 85%, so now I switch it to 100% intensity and it's not flickering anymore, so it's perfect. So now we can have them uh, both side by side. And yeah, I think it's a bit hard to see on camera, but there's definitely a, a difference in intensity. The, uh, the skylight is obviously a lot brighter, but I mean, the difference is not that big, but yeah, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to see the intensity with the, with the naked eye, I guess. I think so far on the left side, we are now at 240 euros for the glass and the light. And I think on the right, we are at 70 euros for the glass and the light. Of course, that's a big difference, but there's also a difference in, in quality. I mean, this light is very sturdy. It's very, it looks nice. I like it. This light is also nice, but it's a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit flimsy and everything, you know? So of course there's a difference in, uh, in quality. Um, but yeah, we'll, we have to find out if that makes a big difference in the way they grow plants. That's the whole point of this experiment. All right, then we're moving on to the, uh, to the substrate. This is actually going to be exactly the same as the previous experiment. So in the high budget tank, we're going to be using Aquasol. This is Neo Soil from Aquario, full of nutrients. I love this stuff. I use it in all my aquascapes. And in the low budget tank, we're going to be using pond soil capped with gravel. So this is what I used in the, uh, the previous experiment as well. But I've learned from my mistakes and this time we're going to do it properly. And also both things are going to get some root taps. These are the Masterline root caps. Yeah, I'm just going to use this because I feel like with the um, pond soil, it's, it's still missing a little bit of nutrients. So just to give it a bit more balance between the two tanks, I'm going to give both tanks some, some root caps. Now there's not necessarily a big price difference between these two substrates. Um, at least not for this size aquarium. I mean, these are very small tanks. And the soil you can buy in 3 liter bags, I think it costs like 15 euro or something like that. And the, this bag, the pond soil, cost me 10 euros. And then I had to buy the extra gravel, which was like 250. So the, all this together is basically the exact same price of a 3 liter bag of aqua soil. But of course with the um, pond soil, you only need a little bit of it. So this bag is going to last you a very long time. So the, the initial investment is pretty much the same for this size aquarium. But in the long run, of course, this method is a lot cheaper. Okay, I'm just going to get started with the aqua soil. So I always like to first add in just a small layer on the bottom. Um, so, and if I'm using root taps, this small layer will just help to kind of keep those root taps in place. So I'm just going to add a small layer. then. Take a few of these root caps. I always like to just open them up and then just sprinkle them all over the substrate. So we just open them up, sprinkle them. Okay, so five root caps. Okay, so that's the aqua soil done. So we have a nice a thin layer in front, a little bit thicker in the back. I think that was roughly three liters, maybe a little bit less. And yeah, that's why I just why I like aqua soil, you know, it's just so easy to work with. You just pour it in and you're ready to get started on your hardscape and your plants. Uh, then we're moving on to the, uh, the budget tank. So we're going to use the pond soil and the gravel. And this gravel, it's basically like the cheaper stuff I could find in my local pet shop. I'm not sure if this needs to be washed or not. Aquarium gravel is ready to use. Okay, just going to open a bag maybe check a little bit if it needs to be washed or not. Okay, that looks good. Just add a little bit of water, but the water is still crystal clear. So I think you can just pour it straight in. Of course, we want to start with the uh, pond soil first. Okay, I think that's good. Like I said, I'm still uh, very much an amateur when it comes to these dirty tanks, so... Yeah, I'm always wondering if I if you can use too much of this stuff, you know? Like with Aquasol, like, you can't really use too much Aquasol, there's no such thing. But with this, I'm not sure. So I've just removed some of these big particles just to make sure that we don't get any floating debris, basically. So I think we can now cover this with our uh, gravel and then we're all good.
Okay, that's the substrate layer done. I kind of like that they, they look different. Like the budget aquarium really has that budget feel to it with the, with the gravel. Honestly, I'm really excited about this, this experiment. I really want to see what kind of results we can get with this budget setup. I mean, I'm, I'm all for budget aquariums and I think it's all about just about finding the right combination of products. And I think even with, yeah, with the, uh, the setup that we have going on right here and the things I'll show you later, like we can still get some really good results. Next up is I'm gonna wet the substrate and just make it very moist and then we can start planting. So the aquarium, I'm not gonna use any hardscape this time. It's basically just gonna be like a, like a little Dutch style tank. So we're gonna just use plants um, because that's the main, the main reason why we're doing this, right? Just to see what the difference is between the plant growth and just how well we can grow plants in a budget setup comparing to a high-tech setup basically. Not high-tech, high budget setup. This is way too much of course, but these are all the plants that I recovered from the previous experiment basically. So we have like a bunch of uh, Ludwigia repens, we have a lot of the um, Micranthema mombrosum, Monte Carlo, Marsalea, uh, Rotala orange juice, Bucephalandra, uh, weeping moss as well. So we're going to try to use as much as possible. The rest of the while I have to just give away to some people. And then I also have a few new plants. So I recently set up another tank. Uh, so we have some, uh, some beautiful Hygophila pinatifida. We have some more Marsalea carinata. And then we have some, a little bit of Liliopsis as well. So I'd like to use this as well instead of throwing it away. So I don't really have a plan for these tanks, but yeah, I'm gonna try to make a distinctive foreground, midground and background. I think that's important, especially in the Dutch style. But yeah, we only have 22 centimeters from the back. So there's not a whole lot of room to make a foreground, a midground, and a background, but I'm gonna try my best. Oh, and I forgot I have this one as well. I recently bought a pot of in vitro plants, but I didn't use it. So I had this plant left over. I bought it for a layout, but I didn't use it because it grows quite big. But I mean, in this gram it's suitable. So we have, this plant is called Nesea pedicalata species golden, something like that, very difficult name. But this is a beautiful, beautiful plant. So we're definitely gonna use that in here. So I think I need to make like a little planting map for these two tanks, otherwise, otherwise it's just gonna be messy. So let me just write some things down. So just to make sure that both tanks get an equal amount of plants, I just spent a few minutes kind of dividing everything up into good portions. So we have one tray for the high budget tank and one tray for the low budget tank. So I think that's pretty much equal. Made a little planting map as well. So foreground, midground, background. Yeah, nobody will be able to understand those scribbles besides me. Um, so I think we're all ready for planting, so let's cue the time-lapse. All right, so that's the planting completed. I think it looks really good. I think we have a nice colorful mix. So I'll put all the plant names in the, in the video description, but just to kind of go over it quickly. So in the foreground, we have a carpet of Monte Carlo. And then on the sides, we have some Marsalea herzuta. Just behind the Marsalea, we also have just a little touch of the Liliopsis. And so that's gonna mix in nicely all together. Then behind the uh, Marsalea, we have a little bit of the Hygophila pinatifida. I've just glued it onto this ceramic plant ring just to hold it down and like in a few days it will find its roots into the uh, into the substrate. But it doesn't really have any roots right now so it's really hard to, to plant it. That's why I've, I've glued it to the ring. Just next to the hygrophila I've added a little bit of um, Alternanthera reineke mini. Just stole that from my Red Plants Aquascape. And then the, the full middle is the, uh, the in vitro plant that I had left over. The Nesea pedicalata golden. Then we have a little bit more of the Reneke Mini. And all the way to the right, I've planted one Blixa Japonica. 
Um, this, is, uh, this is one of my favorite plants, so I'm hoping that it will do well in here. Behind the Blixa we have some the Ludwigia repens. Then in the middle of the background we have the Microntamum umbrosum. And all the way to the left we have the Rotala orange juice. That's it basically. So now we can move the tanks back to the shelf, fill them up with, fill them up with water, and then we can talk about the rest of the, uh, the equipment that we're going to be using for these two tanks. Okay, so now the next day, tanks are filled up with water, the water is pretty clear, and I've also already installed the filters. So the only thing left to do today is to install the CO2 system, and after that we can talk a little bit about how I'm going to run these tanks in the next few weeks regarding light, light schedule, CO2 schedule, and fertilization. And then we can sit back, relax, and watch the experiment unfold. This aquarium gave me such a headache yesterday. Uh, usually I don't really have a lot of floaters when I, when I use Aquasol, but yesterday the Rotala and the Ludwigia just kept floating up, it was super annoying. <laughs> I was swearing so many times yesterday. So now I tie them to a, to a rock just to keep them in place. And with the, uh, yeah, the dirty tank, with the gravel, I didn't have any floaters because the gravel is a lot heavier, of course. But yeah, so far I'm enjoying the gravel a lot more. But let's talk a little bit about the filtration quickly. So in the high budget tank, I'm using the same filter that I used with the previous experiments. This is the Daniel's Capers Flow. It's basically like a combination of a hang on the back filter and an external filter. It's quite good. This one costs about 70, 80 euros. Um, yeah, it has a lot of space for media, so it's really good. It has this clear intake and outtake, so it looks very minimalistic as well. And on the low budget tank, I'm just using a very simple internal filter. So yeah, super simple. Um, I think I need to replace this one because these suction cups are not really working anymore. They keep getting loose. Um, but yeah, nothing wrong with the internal filter. I mean, I think if there's one thing in the planter tank hobby that's a little bit uh, that people stress about too much over, it's filtration. I think filtration is one thing that you can definitely save money on. So the only thing both tanks are still missing is a CO2 system. Now, just because we have a low budget tank, that doesn't mean that we cannot use a CO2 system. So I think a lot of my viewers probably already know my DOI CO2 system. And yeah, that's what we have right here. This is my famous DOI CO2 system. So it's very simple. I'm just going to give you a quick explanation. So a lot of times with these DOI CO2 systems, you will hear people say that it's very unstable and it only lasts for maybe two, three weeks or something like that. This system, however, is very stable and it will last you six, seven weeks easily. So we, it's very simple. We just have a one and a half liter bottle. In here, we have a mixture of sugar and gelatin. We basically boil some water with sugar. Then to that, we add gelatin. And that mixture sits at the bottom of the bottle. Then to that we add some more water with yeast. So the yeast is then consuming the sugar and in that process it produces CO2. So it's a very simple process and it actually pr produces a lot of CO2. Now because we've added gelatin, the, the sugar is basically turned into a jelly and that makes it a little bit harder for the yeast to consume the sugar. So that's why the, the process is basically prolonged. So that's why these bottles can easily last six, seven weeks. So we have one and a half liter bottle I've drilled a small hole into the cap, then we have the airline hose going into the cap and we've sealed the, the, the cap with some glue, some silicone glue or just super glue. Just make sure it's completely airtight, it's very important. If it's not airtight, it will not build any pressure. And if we try to squeeze this bottle, it's very hard to squeeze it, so we have a good pressure in here. I prepared this one two days ago and we already have CO2 bubbles coming out of the CO2 diffuser. So there's a whole video about this CO2 system on my channel and of course I will leave it on top of the screen in the video description. So definitely check that out if, you, if you're on a low budget and you want to use a CO2 system. But yeah, I've been using the CO2 systems for a very long time before when I just started the hobby and I still use them to this day so they work very well for me. And yeah, this will be the, the CO2 system for the low budget tank basically.
And then for our high budget tank, we of course will use a proper CO2 system. So I have a pressurized CO2 cylinder and a CO2 regulator. This is the Strideways regulator. Looks like a really good piece of kit. This will be the first time I'm using it. So the main advantages for this over the DOI system is that with this you can exactly control how much CO2 you want. Uh, it has a magnetic valve so we can shut the CO2 off at night. And of course this will last a lot longer than the DOI CO2 system. It is more expensive of course. I think the regulator itself is about 100 to 110 euros. A CO2 cylinder, this one is 2 kilograms, is about 80 euros. So we're just going to quickly set this up. So inside the regulator there's already like a, um, I think it's Teflon, a Teflon ring. So we need to make sure that that is in and then we can just attach it to the CO2 cylinder. So we just screw the regulator onto the CO2 cylinder. Basically just until we can no longer twist it. And then in the box we have this small wrench and we can just tighten it a little bit. It doesn't have to be super tight. So you don't have to use all your force to just tighten it, so just, that's enough. And then we can attach the bubble counter to make sure it's upright. Attach our bubble counter like so. And we fill the bubble counter with some water. I saw at Green Aqua they use this special bubble counter liquid. I think you need to buy it as well. Yeah, the water always evaporates after some time, so you can never really see how many bubbles per second you're actually injecting. So I'm not sure what that bubble counter solution is. I think it's like glycerine or something like that. But yeah, for now we'll just use water. So we'll close the bubble counter again. And then we can attach our CO2 hose, which I have already prepared. So I just have about one meter worth of clear silicone tubing. And then at the end, I have a little check valve. And just after the check valve, we will add the CO2 diffuser. So I think there's already a check valve in the regulator itself in here. But I also like to add another check valve just very close to the diffuser, because what happens when we shut the CO2 off, the water will start flowing back into the diffuser, into the system basically. So if we don't have this check valve, the water will go all the way back, all the way back to the regulator. I'm not sure if that can cause any, any issues, but the thing is that when, then in the morning, your CO2 system turns on again, and it first has to push out all the water back, back through the diffuser, which takes a lot of time and a lot of pressure as well. So all this pressure is gonna build up into your CO2 hose, and it's just, that's just not what you want. So you wanna add a uh, check valve just very close to the, to the diffuser, now we just add the silicone tubing to our um, bubble counter. Twist the cap back on. And then we're basically good to go. So this regulator already has a magnetic valve. And this one is with a USB cord, which is nice. So we can just plug this into a, um, like a smart socket or an analog timer. And just put the CO2 system on a timer. So we have, what I always have is... For small tanks like this, I'll have the CO2 system come on one hour before the lights come on and it will switch off one hour before the lights come go off as well. So that's it basically. So it's a little bit more expensive, quite a bit more expensive actually, but it's just nice to be able to switch everything off, regulate it properly so you, don't, you know for sure that you're not going to uh, kill your fish with too much CO2 or whatever. So this is a bit of an investment of course, but like a proper regulator will last you like a really, really long time. Like 10 years plus easily and of course you need to get the co2 bottle refilled but yeah those are just small small costs that just come with the hobby you know so yeah that's our co2 system prepared let's hook it up to the tank and then we're basically done okay so here below the shelf we have both co2 systems this is the doi co2 system and this is the the one for the high budget tank so i've already uh, plug the, the magnetic valve into a timer. So the only thing we need to do now is open the uh, the fine needle valve. Here we go. So we'll set it to like one bubble per second. It's about one bubble per second. CO2 diffuser is in. It will take a few minutes before the CO2 starts coming out here. 
If this one is already up and running, so we're all good. So I'm really curious to see how both tanks will develop in the next few weeks. Curious to see if the high budget tank is going to develop much better, much faster, and we'll see. So I think the two things that are going to have the biggest impact on this experiment is the light and the substrate. So the light from this tank is a lot more powerful, but of course it's actually too powerful, so I have to dim it down. So I'll probably reduce it to about 70% or so. And I think for now I'll keep both lights on for eight hours. That's what I usually have with all my tanks. But I think once the low budget tank is a bit more stable, I might increase the, the time to about 10 hours or maybe even 12 hours and see with the, the longer photo period, we might be able to catch up with the intensity from the high budget tank. Now, before we end the video, we of course have to take a look at the total costs. So for the high budget tank, the tank itself was 72 euros. The light, the Skylight AQI 40 is 170 euros. The Strideways Pro CO2 regulator is 110 euros. The CO2 bottle, I'm going for a 500 gram bottle, is 42.50. The filter, the Daniel Escapers Flow is 73 euros. And the substrate, the Aquario Neo Soul is 17 euros which comes down to a total of 484 euros and 50 cents. And then for our low budget tank, so the green Aqua Optic White 36P is 46 euros. The Twin Star Beeline LED light is 30 euros. For the DOI CO2 system, I just wrote down five euros. Uh, the filter is 14 euros. The gravel is 250 and the pond soil is 10 euros, which comes down to a total of 107 euros and 50 cents. So almost 400 euros difference between the two tanks. Of course, there's always ways to make the low budget tank even more, even cheaper and the high budget tank even more expensive. But I think we have a cool setup going on right now. So guys, let me know in the comments, what do you think is going to happen with this experiment? What are your predictions? Uh, don't forget to smash that like button. Really hope you enjoyed this. And if you're not subscribed to the channel yet, hit the subscribe button. I want to thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time. Take care.